Chapter 36, The Quarterdeck. It was not a great while after the affair of the pipe that one morning, shortly after breakfast, Ahab, as was his wont, ascended the cabin gangway to the deck. There, most sea captains usually walk at that hour as country gentlemen, after the same meal, take a few turns in the garden. Soon his steady ivory stride was heard as to and fro he paced his old rounds upon planks so familiar to his tread that they were all over dented like geological stones with a peculiar mark of his walk. Did you fixedly gaze too upon that ribbed and dented brow? There also you would see still stranger footprints, the footprints of his once unsleeping, ever pacing thought. But on the occasion in question, those dents looked deeper, even as his nervous step that morning left a deeper mark. And so full of his thought was Ahab, that at every uniform turn that he made, now at the main mast and now at the binnacle, you could almost see that thought turn in him, as he turned and paced in him as he paced, so completely possessing him indeed that it all but seemed the inward mold of every outer movement. Do you mark him, Flask? whispered Stubb. The chicks that in him pecks the shell. Twill soon be out. The hours were on. Ahab now shut up within the cabin and on pacing the deck with the same intense bigotry of purpose in his aspect. It drew near the close of day. Suddenly, he came to a halt by the bulwarks, and inserting his bone leg into the auger hole there, and with one hand grasping a shroud, he ordered Starbucks to send everybody aft. Sir, said the mate, astonished at the order, seldom or never given on shipboard except in some extraordinary case. Send everybody aft, repeated Ahab. Mastheads there, come down. When the entire ship's company were assembled and with curious and not wholly unimpressive faces were eyeing him, for he looked not unlike the weather horizon when a storm is coming up, Ahab, after rapidly glancing over the bulwarks and then darting his eyes among the crew, started from his standpoint and as though not a soul were nigh him resumed his heavy turns upon the deck. With bent head and half slouched hat, he continued to pace, unmindful of the wondering whispering among the men. Till Stubb cautiously whispered to Flask that Ahab must have summoned them there for the purpose of witnessing a pedestrian feat. But this did not last long. Vehemently pausing, he cried. What do you do when you see a whale, men? Sing out for him, was the impulsive rejoinder from the score of clubbed voices. Good, cried Ahab with a wild approval in his tones, observing the hearty animation into which his unexpected question had so magnetically thrown them. And what do you do next? Lower away and after him. And what tune is it that ye pull to men? A dead whale or a stove boat. More and more strangely and fiercely glad and approvingly, the crew grew the countenance of the old man at every shout, while the mariners began to gaze curiously at each other as if marveling how it was that they themselves became so excited at such seemingly purposeless questions. But they were all eagerness again as Ahab now half revolving in his pivot hole with one hand reaching high up the shroud and tightly, almost convulsively grasping it, addressed them thus. Ah, ye mask-headers have before now heard me give orders about a white whale. Looky, do you see this Spanish ounce of gold? Holding up a broad, bright coin to the sun, it is a $16 piece, men. Do you say it? Mr. Starbuck, hand me yon top maul. While the mate was getting the hammer, 
Ahab, without speaking, was slowly rubbing the gold piece against the skirts of his jacket, as if to heighten its luster, and without using any words, was meanwhile lowly humming to himself, producing a sound so strangely muffled and inarticulate that it seemed the mechanical hummings of the wheels of his vitality in him. Receiving the top maul from Starbuck, he advanced toward the main mast with the hammer uplifted in one hand, exhibiting the gold with the other, and with a high raised voice exclaiming, However have he raises me a white-headed whale with a wrinkled brow and a crooked jaw, whosoever have he raises me that white-headed whale with three holes punctured in his starboard fluke, look ye, whosoever have he raises me with that same white whale, he shall have this gold ounce, my boys. Huzza, huzza, cried the seaman as with swinging tarpaulins they hailed the act of nailing the gold to the mast. It's a white whale, I say, resumed Ahab, as he threw down the top maul. A white whale. Skin your eyes, Tram men. Look sharp for white water. If ye see but a bubble, sing out. All this while, Tastego, Dagu, and Queequeg had looked on with even more intense interest and surprise than the rest, and at the mention of the wrinkled brow and crooked jaw, they had started and stared at each other, as if each was separately touched by some specific recollection. Captain Ahab, said Tashigo, that white whale must be the same one they call Moby Dick. Moby Dick, shouted Ahab, do ye know the white whale then, Tash? Does he fan tail a little curious, sir, before he goes down? Said the gay header deliberately. And has he a curious spout too? Said Dragu, Dagu, very bushy, even for a palmaceti, and mighty quick, Captain Ahab. And he have one, two, three, tall, Oh, four, good many ironed in him hide too, Captain, cried Quick-Quake disjointedly. Oh, twi twisky, tee be twisk like him, him, faltering hard for a word and screwing his hand round and round as though uncorking a bottle, like, like him, him. Corkscrew, cried Ahab. Aye, Quick-Quake, the harpoon lie all twisted and wrenched in him. I drag Dagu. His spout is a big one, like a whole shock of wheat and white as a pile of our Nantucket wool after the great annual sheep shearing. Aye, Testigo, and he fail tails like a split jib and a squall. Death and devils, men. It is Moby Dick ye have seen. Moby Dick. Moby Dick. Captain Ahab, said Starbuck who was stubborn flask had thus far been eyeing his superior with increasing surprise, but at last seemed struck with a thought which somewhat explained all the wonder. Captain Ahab, I have heard of Moby Dick, but it was not Moby Dick that took off thy leg? Who told you that? cried Ahab, then pausing. I, Starbuck, I, my hearties all grand. It was Moby Dick that dismasked me. Moby Dick that brought me to this dead stump I stand on now. Aye, aye, he shouted with a terrific, loud animal sob like that of a heart-stricken moose. Aye, aye, it was that cursed white whale that raised me, made a poor pigging lumber of me. And forever and a day. Then tossing both arms with measureless imprecations, he shouted out, Ay, ay, and I'll chase him round Good Hope and round the Horn and round the Norway Maelstrom and round Perdition's Flames before I give up. And this is what ye have shipped for, men, to chase that white whale on both sides of land, all over sides of earth, till he spouts black blood and rolls thin out. What say ye, men? Splice hands on it now? I think ye do look brave. Aye, aye, shouted the harpooners and seamen, running closer to the excited old man. 
a sharp eye for the white whale, a sharp lance for Moby Dick. God bless ye, he seemed to half sob and half shout. God bless ye men, steward, go draw the great major of Grog. But what's this long face about, Mr. Starbuck? Wilt that not chase the white whale? Art not game for Moby Dick? I am game for his crooked jaw. I am for his paws and jaws of death, too. Captain Ahab, if it fairly comes in the way of the business we follow. But I came here to hunt whales, not my commander's vengeance. How many barrels will thy vengeance yield thee if thou guessed it? It, it will not fetch thee much in our Nantucket market. Nantucket market, coat. But come closer, Starbuck, thou requires a little lower layer. If money's to be the measure man and the accountants have computed their great counting house, but the globe by girting it with its guineas, one to every three parts of an inch, then let me tell thee that my vengeance will fetch a great premium here. He smiles his chest, whispered Strub. What's that for? Methinks it rings most fast, but hollow. Vengeance on a dumb brute, cried Starbuck. That simply smote thee from blindest instinct. Madness to be enraged with a dumb thing. Captain Ahab seems blasphemous. Hark ye yet again, the little lower layer. All visible objects, man, are but as pasteboard mass. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the moldings of its featured from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask, how can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall shoved near to me. Sometimes I think there's naught beyond, but tis enough. He tasks me, he heaps me. I see in him outrageous strength and with an inscrutable malice swinding it. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate and be the white whale agent or be the white whale principal. I will wreck that hate upon him. Talk not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. For could the sun do that, then could I do the other, since there is ever a sort of fair play herein, jealousy presiding over all creatures. But not my master man is even that fair play. Who's over me? Truth hath no confines. Take off thine eye. More intolerable than fiend's glarings is a doltish stare. So, so. Thou reddest and palest, my heat has melted thee to anger glow. But look ye, Starbuck, what is said in heat, that thing unsays itself. There are men from whom warm words are small indignity. I meant not to incense thee, let it go. Look, see yonder Turkish cheeks of spotted tawn, living, breathing pictures painted by the sun, the pagan leopards the unwrecking and unworshipping things that live and seek and give no reasons for the torrid life they feel. The crew, man, the crew. Are they not one and all with Ahab in this matter of the whale? See Stab, he laughs. See yonder Chilean, he snorts to think of it. Stand up amid the general hurricane. Thy one tossed sapling cannot, Starbuck. And what is it? Reckon it. Tis but to help strike a fin, no wondrous feat for Starbuck. What is it more? From this one poor hunt, then the best lance out of all Nantucket. Surely he will not hang back when every foremast hand was clutched a whetstone. Ah, constraining seize thee, I see. The billows lift thee. Speak, but speak, ay, ay, thy silence then that voices thee. Something shot from my dilated 
my dilated nostrils. He has inhaled it in his lungs. Starbuck is now mine. Cannot oppose me now without rebellion. God, keep me. Keep us all, murmured Starbuck lowly. But in his joy at the enchanted tacit acquiescence of the mate, Ahab did not hear his foreboding invocation, nor yet the low laugh from the hold, nor yet the presaging vibrations of the winds in the cordage, nor did the hollow flap of the sails against the mast as for the moment their hearts sank in. For again, Starbuck's downcast eyes lighted up with the stubbornness of life. The subterranean laugh died away. The winds blew on. The sails filled out. The ship heaved and rolled as before. Ah, ye admonitions and warnings, why stay ye not when they come? But rather, are ye predictions than warnings, ye shadows? Yet not so much predictions from without as verifications of the foregoing things within. For with little external to constrain us, the innermost necessities in our being, this still drives us on. The measure, the measure, cried Ahab. Receiving the brimming pewter and turning to the harpooners, he ordered them to produce their weapons. Then ranging them before him near the capstan with their harpoons in their hands, while his three mates stood at his side with their lances and the rest of the ship's company formed a circle round the group, he stood for an instant searchingly, eyeing every man of his crew. But those wild eyes met his, as the bloodshot eyes of the prairie wolves meet the eye of their leader, ere he rushes on at their head in the trail of the bison. But alas, only to fall into the hidden snare of the Indian. Drink and pass, Ahab cried, handing the heavy charge flagon to the nearest seaman. The crew alone now drink. Round with it, round. Short drops, long swallows, men, tis hot as Satan's hoof. So, so, it goes round excellently. It spiralizes in ye, forks out at the serpent's snapping eye. Well done, almost drained. That way it went, this way it comes. Hand it me, here's a hollow. Men, ye seem the years, so brimming life is gulped and gone. Steward, refill. Attend now, my braves, I have mustered ye all round this capstan, and ye mates flank me with your lances, and ye harpooners, stand there with your irons, and ye stout mariners, ring me in that I may in some short revive a noble custom of my fishermen fathers before me. Oh, men, you will yet see that. Ha! Boy, come back. Bad pennies come not sooner. Hand it to me. Why now this pewter had run brimming again. Weren't not thou St. Vitus imp? Away, thou Argo. Advance, ye males. Advance, ye mates. Cross your lances full before me. Well done, that we touch the axes. So saying with extended arm, he grasped the three level radiating lances at their cross center. While so doing, suddenly and nervously twitched them. Meanwhile, glancing intently from Starbuck to Stub, <coughs> from Stub to Flask, it seemed as though by some nameless interior volition, he would fain have shocked them into the same fiery mo emotion accumulated within the laden jar of his own magnetic life. The three mates quailed before his strong, sustained, and mystic aspect. Stub and Flask looked sideways from him. The honest eye of Starbuck fell downright. In vain, cried Ahab, but maybe tis well. For did ye three but once take the full force shock, then mine own electric thing, that had perhaps expired from out of me, perchance. Two, it would have dropped ye dead, perchance ye need it not. Down, lances, and down, ye mates. I do appoint ye three cup bearers to my three pagan kinsmen there. 
yawn three most honorable gentlemen and noblemen, my valiant harpooners, disdain the task. What? When the great Pope washes the feet of beggars using his tiara for our? Oh, my sweet cardinals, your own condescension, that shall bend ye to it. I do not order ye, ye will it. Cut your seizings and draw the poles, ye harpooners. Silently obeying the order, the three harpooners now stood with the detached iron part of their harpoons, some three feet long held barbs up before him. Stab me not with that keen steel. Cant them, cant them, over. Know ye not the goblet end? Turn up the socket. So, so now, ye cupbearers advance. The irons take them. Hold them while I fill. Forthwith, slowly going from one officer to the other, he brimmed the harpoon sockets with the fiery waters from the pewter. Now three to three ye stand. Commend the murderous chalices. Bestow them, ye who are now made parties to this indissoluble league. Ha! Starbuck! But the deed is done. Yon ratifying sun now waits to sit upon it. Drink, ye harpooners, drink and swear. Ye men that man the dreadful whale boat's bow. Death to Moby Dick. God hunt us all, as we do not hunt Moby Dick to his death. The long barbed steel goblets were lifted, and to cries and maledictions against the whale, the spirits were simultaneously quaffed down with a hiss. Starbuck paled and turned and shivered. Once more and finally, the replenished pewter went the rounds among the frantic crew. When waving his free hand to them, they all dispersed and Ahab retired to his cabin.